Based on current data, South Africa is unlikely to meet its health department target to vaccinate 70% of the adult population against COVID-19 by December. Mass vaccination communication has taken a backseat in recent weeks, partly because of the local government elections. Well, we're joined now uh, by Dr. Aslam Dasu. He is with the Progressive Health Forum, Professor Haneli Meyer from the Sifakomahato Health Sciences University, and Professor Mosa Moshabela, who is with the University of KwaZulu Natal. Good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for your time tonight. Firstly, we, we haven't had, uh, you know, the kind of cases and, and infection rate of COVID-19 in the, in, in the country over this period than throughout the rest of the year. Uh, Dr. Dassou, what do you attribute that to? Well, I'd like to attribute it to everything going back to normal, but it's obviously not the case. It's likely uh, to be the result of a couple of things. One is that there's been a high degree of natural infection in the country. You know, lots of people have been infected um, and so have a degree of natural immunity. And then there has been uh, at least some vaccination, uh, particularly in high-risk groups, uh, that may be having an effect. Overall, I think this trough is, is difficult to fully explain compared to the troughs between the waves that preceded this. But overall, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a sign that we are past anything. We are still very much in the grip of the pandemic. The numbers in Europe are frightening in terms of the amount of infection. Germany yesterday uh, recorded its highest ever number of new infections and this is in a highly vaccinated country of course i don't think that will translate into overwhelming health facilities because as you know the vaccine does protect against severe disease and death but we are in a in a, in a sweet spot if i can put it like that but this is exactly not the time to take our foot off the pedal for vaccinating people nor getting too complacent because the anticipated fourth wave is not far off and we just i think sitting with bated breath hopeful that the previous uh, couple of weeks of activity around the election won't translate into mm. cluster outbreaks or super spreader events uh, professor may a sweet spot as dr dasu has described it is hard to explain because all of the conditions under which COVID-19 would have ordinarily prevailed. Um, we have seen over the last month or so that political parties have been on the campaign trail, but uh, those numbers remain consistently low. How do you explain it? Yes, you know, I would also like to say, um, you know, according to me, I think also, you know, people become, um, you know, complacent. So, so you become uh, people become a bit more relaxed because you don't see these high rates of infection anymore and then on the other hand there's the vaccination and there's still a lot of fears and so on around the adverse events so it might also that people you know looking at uh, the fear of having an adverse event against the fear of the disease itself um, and you know that is something that we need to I think communicate more on, um, you know, to make people understand that, you know, you shouldn't actually look at it that way. Um, and that, that your fear of an adverse event shouldn't be larger than your fear of the disease. It would not be good for us to wait until we get infected because you can end up in hospital, you can even die, you infect a lot of other people as well. So that would not be a good idea. And also, um, as my colleague said, you know, there's, there's a, a fourth wave coming. And if people are more complacent now, they don't follow all these precautionary measures any longer, it might drive this fourth wave. And even worse, it can drive, you know, we can, we can end up with a new variant because the more people get infected, the more opportunities for this virus to multiply and, you know, um, mutate. And then in the end, we'll, we'll um, end up with a new variant and that would really not be good. Uh, Professor Mashabella, would you say that the behavior of this virus 
is the same to what it has been when it first reached our, uh, our shores, especially when we look at um, these peaks and troughs, as Dr. Dassou was explaining earlier. Because again, many South Africans by now uh, have been anticipating that we would have seen something in relation to uh, an increase in, in these numbers. Yeah, um, greetings, Cathy, and to the viewers. I, I think firstly, you know, the break is actually very much welcome. And I, I want to make sure that we are clear about that, that it's a good space to be in. But I also think that there's a number of things. The, the first thing I want to mention here, it's, it's also what Dr. Tessius mentioned, the issue of immunity. I think we have dealt with a, the Delta virus, which we know was highly transmissible. And because it was highly transmissible, it sweeps very quickly. You know, the way we refer to it is, it's almost as if it burns itself out. It, it transmits so fast that it burns itself out. And so in a way, I think what we are seeing is high levels of immunity, both from infection, but also from, from a vaccination. Um, remember that we ramped up our vaccination pretty quickly. If you combine that with the fact that so far, we haven't really seeded a, a, a variant that is aggressive. Uh, we are also very lucky in that regard. If we had a different kind of variant, uh, it may actually have uh, sort of ripped through. The last thing I want to mention is this issue of um, travel. Um, you know, internationally, the, we now have very strict travel restrictions, very, very strict. So people have to test negative, people have to be vaccinated. South Africa it insists on a PCR, a recent PCR test, and they insist on vaccination. So these things become really important internationally because now they begin to limit the rate at which uh, new variants can be seeded from other countries. Even though it may not stop completely, it does reduce it, unlike what was the case previously when we did not have vaccination. And Kathy, I just want to say also that lastly that I think in South Africa, for, from a public health perspective, in as much as we had a, an issue with the crowds that were gathering during elections, from my own perspective, I felt that, you know, it's a catch-22. Uh, if, if we ended up with a situation where crowds are not allowed to gather, we were going to complain that elections were not free and fair. Now we don't complain about that. We feel that elections were free and fair. And sometimes I feel like you know, there is some sort of justified risk to some extent. And so I'm sort of a little bit in between about the crowds mm -hmm. around the elections. If it was crowds for something else, perhaps I would have an issue. But in this case, I think that uh, we, we can live with it. Dr. Dassou, let's talk about then the expectations going into the December and the festive period, because undoubtedly that's what is going to be on a lot of people's minds. Yes, of course. I, I also think that the, the targets for vaccination by the end of the year were quite ambitious to start with. And as, as things have turned out, the uptake has dropped significantly. And uh, those targets are not likely to be reached. And I think people just need to be aware of that. But that is not an important thing in and of itself. Because as long as the vaccination program continues and more people get vaccinated, you know, we will reach sufficient numbers of people. But as far as the end of the year is concerned, look, last year we had a number of super spreader events around this time or toward the end of November last year, you know, those school parties and so on, and the addition of the beta variant, which then triggered the, the second wave through to February, and that was quite horrendous. Um, we don't have a variant on the horizon that anyone has picked up so far. Uh, although one, one has to keep a surveillance on it very tightly. The, ex the predictions were that it would occur, this fourth wave would begin in early December. It still may, it may be a little later, but we will have a wave. The, 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 the major um, uh, um, a difference with the preceding waves is what Professor Mushabella has said, that there has been a high degree of, of uh, infection by Delta. And if Delta is going to be the cause of the next wave, then it's likely that that wave will be attenuated. You know, we had over 100,000 people dying in the third wave, you know, and we might get half or less than half of that. Now, that is still a very serious issue, but it won't 
overwhelm services like it did in the other two waves. And let's be clear, services were overwhelmed. They were not, it wasn't just being threatened. Our services really got overwhelmed by those two waves. And, and you know, we, we, we suffered great numbers of, of casualties. We're not expecting that in the fourth wave. Um, and of course, I think the more we get the over 50s vaccinated, over and above everything else, get them, that particular cohort, vaccinated to over 80%, we will have a major impact on the sustainability of our health services because they represent the highest proportion of numbers who get admitted to hospital and who may die. So, you know, so, so we have to pull out all the stops to get to that group. And unfortunately, we're not doing a great job of it right now. Uh, Professor Mayer, do you believe that we are making the most of the lessons we have learned over uh, the past 18 months um, and putting them to good use in as far as even the preparedness and the readiness of our health system? Yes, w we could well not see the, the scale of, uh, of illness or even death that we face, but with still such a high number of the population not vaccinated, that risk remains with us. Yes, definitely. And, and I absolutely agree. We need to focus now on the people at highest risk. So those over 50, over 60, and those with uh, who are immunocompromised as well. So those people need to be vaccinated first. And, you know, huge efforts need to go into that. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of initiatives at the moment, um, you know, new initiatives that, that's taking place. There are these... Uh, Vuma uh, weekends. So um, I think but, but a lot more needs to be done in terms of communication. Look, since the start of the pandemic, there's been a lot of communication um, around vaccination and COVID-19 and so on, but a lot of it has been actually electronic communication. So communication needs to be taken now to the people out there, those who, who haven't been reached yet, and then also to take the vaccines to them. I don't think we have done enough in terms of, you know, improving access. And what people also need to remember, yes, there's a lot of natural immunity, I think, at the moment. But, I mean, we know that natural immunity wanes much quicker um, than, than vaccine immunity. So that's also something that we need to, to keep in mind. And then in terms of the communication, I think we need to embrace this whole idea of, of hope um, because we all want to go back to complete normality and vaccination is, is the only hope so we need to embrace that and then use different ways of communicating you know have have leaders in the community to participate to take those messages to the people who need them and to to make people understand what are the dangers of finally not being vaccinated. Mm. Professor Mushabelo, let me end off with you because ultimately we're, we're, we're looking at a situation where um, the, the, the first world has already gotten into booster shots uh, for their populations. We're still struggling just to cover uh, the basis of our population, at least even where the high-risk individuals are, are concerned. When are we going to have that conversation? I know uh, for the health workers, we're part of the Sisonke trial, uh, the third shots have already begun, but are we going to need to have those who uh, got the shot early on to start coming in to get their boosters? Um, Kathy, I think in terms of the question of boosters, so far the consensus is largely around the fact that um, in South Africa we don't yet have a policy on boosters and we are unlikely to have that policy at least until um, there is definitive evidence around people who are most at risk that may be considered for booster shots. It's unlikely that South Africa will consider boosters for the general population anytime soon. And perhaps until we have had most people vaccinated in South Africa. And unfortunately, you know, we are in, a, in an awkward position in South Africa that we also have a duty towards the rest of Africa. It will always be difficult for us to uh, talk about boosters when most of Africa is, is also still not vaccinated, given the fact that vaccine shots are scarce. So the decision in South Africa to 
to, to go with boosters, it's going to be a very reserved uh, position in terms of who will get boosters. And someone has been making, uh, some scientists have been making distinctions to say, look, if you've got people who have weak immune systems and they have not been able to generate enough response of their immune system to, to an optimal level, getting a third shot is not even a booster. It's really trying to, an additional shot to help boost their immune system. So that argument is already being made to say there may be people who did not mount enough immune system because of weak immunity. So we might we might expect to see that happening and it might come with doctor's prescriptions. So I, I think that, you know, really, even with, with the healthcare workers, we are calling it a, a trial, really. It's not really a policy decision at this point. All right, let's leave it there for tonight. Let me thank you all uh, for your time. Dr. Aslam Dasu, he's with the Progressive Health Forum. Professor Haneli Meyer from the Sifakomakato Health Sciences University and Professor Musa Moshabela from the University of KZN. Certainly a conversation to keep our eye on as we head on into the rest of the year.